welcome to Midlife Matters, where we celebrate women's wisdom and wit. I'm Georgianne Lucier, your host, and I'm delighted to introduce today's guest, Dr. Beverly Kidder. Dr. Kidder is responsible for caregiving programs at the Agency on Aging of South Central Connecticut. Welcome, Dr. Kidder. Thank you so much. Your own experience of being a caregiver for your mother resulted in a book, and it's called The Gift of Caregiving. So maybe we could start by having you talk about who inspired you to capture your experiences in a book. It wasn't so much a who as a what. Mm -hmm. um, I, caregiving was very difficult. Caring for my mother was very challenging. She was not an easy person, a wonderful person, but not easy. I was exhausted, totally exhausted by the experience. And yet when it was over, I found myself lacking energy instead of feeling, you know, imbued with new energy and sad. And I couldn't quite understand why was I feeling that way. And so being a kind of intellectualizing person as opposed to an emotional person, I approached it by trying to sit down and think through what did I what had I gone through? Why did this happen? What was the meaning of it? And that really is what led me to the book because it started to turn into a book of in itself as I began to put my thoughts down on paper, trying to just understand it for myself initially. But then I began to see there's something here that I could share with other people. So that's from your own experience and then you, among many other things, are responsible for caregiving programs. I would think people see the burden first, right, of caregiving? Yes, they do. People have asked me, uh, do people recognize the gift? And I would say in most cases, no. Uh, and I try not to offend people who are active in caregiving by saying to them, oh, you know, you're really blessed by having this opportunity. Mm -hmm. Because they, I had a woman at a conference stand up one day and say to me, who are you kidding? You know, you don't walk in my shoes. You don't know what I feel. And in fact, I do, and I understand it. So I try to tone down that piece of it. Um, most people, and my words for most people are, when it's said and done, what did you get from it? How do you make sense of it? Because that was what my experience was, trying to make it something that um, made sense, that I got something out of. And Because I do believe that all life's experiences have something to teach us and that we can benefit. Um, but for those caregivers who can recognize it, who can hear the words, the experience is so much more meaningful when you begin to recognize this isn't just a one-way street. I'm getting something out of this too. And it can make the caregiving so much better for the care recipient as well. You talk about the importance of having the care recipient feeling treasured and loved. Yes. And truly, when you make the decision to care for somebody else, even when it doesn't feel like a decision or a choice, it, it is. When you do that and you dedicate yourself to that, you really want the person that you're doing it for to get something out of it and to appreciate it. But if it comes from a place of burden, it's very hard for the recipient to feel loved and safe and protected. Um, they pick up on resentment and impatience and anger. And so when the caregiver can begin to recognize that this is something that they get something out of it, this is something really valuable in their life and the experience of things that they uh, go through, then some of that anger can uh, subside a little bit and they can create that opportunity to be in the moment with the person they care for, even if dementia is an issue, to ex be able to celebrate what moments there are left in life and to share that and enjoy it. And so the care recipient starts to enjoy that, feels a little bit better, and then the experience for the caregiver, it's a lot easier to care for someone who's feeling happy and enjoying what's going on as opposed to feeling resented. So it, it eases the burden as you go through it, and it helps one realize it's not only burden. There's burden, there's work, there's no question, but it can be something else as well. And there's so many factors that you identify of how someone can end up being <laughs> a caregiver. In your instance, you talked about it being a gradual process. For some people, I imagine it might be more of a sudden life change. Can you talk a little bit about some of the factors? I know you talked about like birth order and... Yeah. There are 
several factors. Um, some have been studied academically, others just by experience you begin to notice them. Um, but the one really most important predictor of who's going to be a caregiver is gender. Mm -hmm. Caregiving is a role that male caregivers are getting a lot of press because we are seeing a big increase. But a big increase just means going from zero to seven percent. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't mean anything big in the numbers of caregiving. Uh, over 85 percent of all caregiving is done by women. So the first and best predictor is what's your gender. That's going to tell your likelihood. Uh, but then there are several other things. And a lot of them are bound by culture. Different cultures um, approach it differently. Uh, but within separate cultures, the uh, issue of birth order is, is an issue. So in some cultures, it's always the oldest. In other cultures, it's the youngest. But, you know, if you know your culture, your birth order matters. Your gender matters. And then some of the other factors, uh, are you married or not? It tends to fall more often on the single, if there is a single in the family. That's the nominated female. Uh, if it's a single who has no children, uh, so you, th there's a triple threat, you know, female, no children to be responsible for, no husband to be responsible for, the family's going to designate you. Um, I work with a woman who was in that experience, and she took 10 years out of the workforce uh, to be able to care for two parents. And the family expected it, and that's 10 years not paying Social Security, 10 years no income. Um, she did. She lived in her parents' house, and she had no expenses toward the house and the family thought well that's fair compensation but it isn't <laughs> it absolutely isn't and now here she is working later in life than she would like to trying to build up some social security credits so she can retire so that um, picking if you will mm -hmm. on that single woman without children is really an unfair thing that many cultures uh, do that too as well but some of those are, are some of the predictors as to how and then the other really big thing is geography. Uh, you could be the favorite, you could be the oldest, but if you live in California and mom's in Connecticut, the chances are you're not going to be the primary caregiver. The primary caregiver usually has to be living with them or at least in the town, close proximity to, in order to be able to deliver the care. You also talk about honoring the past, people's expectations, entitlement. <laughs> I took care of so-and-so, yeah. therefore it's natural that I will receive care when I need it. That's one of the things that I explored in some length. As I came to understand my mother and began to uncover her role as a caregiver, um, it helped me to start to understand her expectations, often which were totally unreasonable expectations of the people who provided care for her. But if you have been in the position of being a caregiver, you begin to establish your own standards of expectation and your own sense of what goes around comes around. I've done this. And life doesn't always go that way. It's often a, a very big surprise for people who are caregivers that when they reach that point, as my mom did, uh, where now it's my turn, the people they cared for are gone, mm -hmm. and the people who came behind didn't have that experience. So there is no uh, no one to have a reciprocal relationship with. The heirs of the people you cared for are not going to necessarily step up to the plate. So you often get left just as my mom with you know a, a kid who uh, is no longer a kid, <laughs> being expected to be the one to care for you. The ages of people have certainly changed from the early 1800s, what would be considered old age, like maybe 40s. Yes, absolutely. The, when someone was a caregiver, um, if, I, if we go to my grandparents' um, time in life, when they were caring for relatives, there were a few things that happened. One, very often the relative they cared for was living in the household. And, it, and that can make it a lot easier. It, it brings its problems with it. But in those days where you had larger households, you had more people to spread the burden, and you didn't have to travel to get to them. So you didn't have so many, uh, particularly older adults, maintaining their own apartments outside the house. So there was a little, it was a little bit easier that way. But predominantly, you only cared for someone for a very short period of time. Uh, we didn't have old age. We didn't have 30 years of someone slowly deteriorating. People died. 
and they, you know, 42 was the average age of death when my grandmother was uh, a young woman. And it went up only very slowly for the next many decades. It's only now that we're seeing people uh, living so long. So now, if a person retires at 65 and begins to have some need for caregiving, particularly if it's a dementia issue, by their late 60s, and they've lived to 92 and 95. You're 30 years a caregiver. That's a very, very different commitment than the short-term commitment that people in former generations had to make. Let's, let's talk about the difference between paid caregivers and family caregivers. I think that's a topic well worth thinking about because paid caregiving companies will always, I, I watch the ads on TV, will always tell you that we care for your loved one just as if, it, if you were doing it. And that could be good or bad. <laughs> but um, there are differences. It is not the same at all. Even though both may be totally committed to what's best for the individual, I'll give the companies that. But the biggest difference, I think, is paid caregivers work in shifts. And no matter how difficult the person you care for might be, you know at the end of eight hours today, it's over. And it isn't that you just turn on your heel and walk out. There is a responsible person coming in for the next shift. Family caregivers never get their shift to end. Even if you're not living in the home with the individual, your mind is working. You're thinking, you're worrying, you're planning, whatever piece of it. You are responsible and engaged for 24-7. And so you don't get the relief that comes with the shift. So all of the things related to that, that whole sense of time and commitment is tripled for the family caregiver because they don't have those breaks. Uh, respite is an extremely important thing for family caregivers. It's automatically built into the paid caregiver. Respite comes at the end of the shift. For the family caregiver, it depends on how successful they are lining up resources. And within families, that has a varying degree of success. But I've never talked to a caregiver, <coughs> excuse me, who hasn't said it's been a challenge. Even in cooperative families, the burden falls on them to organize it, figure it out, ask for it. It's rarely forthcoming independently. So that piece, you know, is very different. Um, the other thing is uh, overtime. You know, the paid caregiver may run into a problem and can't leave at that moment. Their shift person doesn't arrive to relieve them. Well, they're going to get paid to do another shift. The family caregiver just has to take time away from something else that's important to them, like maybe going to the doctor, mm -hmm. uh, so that they can do more hours and more hours. There's no relief there. So very much related to time are the differences. The other thing that comes in with the, the differences between paid and family caregivers are your roles. The family care, the paid caregiver only knows the person that they're caring for in this one relationship. They're there to care for them. The family caregiver, whether it's child to parent or spouse or sibling, had a relationship prior to caregiving that had a whole bunch of issues related to it. And now caregiving changes that around. There's reversal of roles with parents and children about who's responsible. There's relationship roles between siblings, male to female, spouses. Uh, you know, if you think of your own situation and, and try to picture yourself and your husband in a different situation now because you have all the power and you're going to be the one caring. And you can see down the road the problems that, that can crop up. None of those things are issues. So none of that big emotional overlay exists for the paid caregiver that the poor family caregiver has to go through. Also, the fact that most caregivers are women, women I'm usually in midlife and older, I would think, do you have any wisdom to share about how women can help keep a sense of openness to all the possibilities and age well basically themselves? I wish I had an easy answer for that. But what, what I find, not just from caregiving, but just from getting older myself, um, the, the key, I believe, is creativity. And creativity and change. And whenever you are creative, you are changing things. 
uh, and the willingness to accept change in creativity. Uh, most people who study uh, human development look at it in stages. And there's an awful lot of literature and an awful lot of theories about all of the stages of life. And when then when you get up to older, um, everything kind of grinds to a halt. Nobody is celebrating what are the marvelous accomplishments that can happen. I believe that you can have some of the absolutely best part of your life when you get into that stage because you're free of all of the work that went before. There, there is a, a wonderful book out in which they talk about the first two thirds of life filling the glass and then the last third being able to look at what do I have in the glass and enjoy it. Um, and I really believe that's true. Uh, if you're open to it, if you allow yourself to continue to make change. If you lock yourself in and say, these are the friends I've had all my life, I'm not going to make new friends. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the kind of telephone that I always use, I'm not getting that kind of phone. And, and you set these ridiculous boundaries around yourself, then it gets really hard to watch the world go by you. But if you can be open and be creative about it, then you really have, I think, an opportunity to really enjoy this stage of life. Well, thank you. I'm I'm more inspired now than in the beginning. <laughs> I'd like to talk about your background. You finished college at 19, and you were a social worker in a hospital for almost 30 years. What did you enjoy most about that period of your life and your career? I loved working in the hospital. Uh, I would. Uh, people tell me I don't work there any longer. People tell me there's been changes in hospital social work, but. My experience as a hospital social worker was just fantastic because related to what I was just talking about, the opportunity to change and reinvent your career uh, exists in a structure like a hospital. If you choose to, be, to work for a children's organization, then your whole career is going to be about kids. Or if you work in a poverty organization, it's going to be about fighting poverty. Illness affects everyone across the lifespan and cuts across the whole socioeconomic status. So hospitals are wonderful little microcosms of society. And in that place, you can find all sorts of challenges. So in my career, I had the opportunity to work on pediatrics with kids, in emergency rooms with emergency medicine, to work with the first in the hospital uh, hospice wing with terminally ill people, to work with the first um, in, in our hospital, the first HIV unit and all the challenges that come up. And the biggest part of my career was working in cardiac rehabilitation. It's where I hit my stride with my most academic success and professional uh, recognition. And to be able to work with a team of people and create a program that went on to be a nationally award-winning program, huge uh, opportunity and, and um, delight, really, in being able to have that experience. Plus, working in a hospital as a young woman, because uh, many of my years were young, it was a wonderful source to meet people for dating and all sorts of <laughs> social, social activities. So it was a hospital experience. It was terrific. And then you were laid off. And then 27 years of being a really good employee. Um, yeah, they did economic reasons. They decided to eliminate a whole bunch of middle management at the hospital. And one day I was there, and the next day I was gone, quite literally. That was really a difficult, difficult time. Um, but doors closed, windows open. Um, for many years, uh, I had wanted to have a baby, and that didn't happen in my life. Um, I married my husband. We were able to adopt a child. And I lost my job, but I had a new responsibility. So I thought, well, I'm going to just be a full-time mother. I waited so long for this. But I had drive to do other things, and I'd always been interested. I always wanted my own yarn store. I'm a knitter. I wanted a store. I wanted to teach knitting, you know. And my husband created that opportunity for me. Um, so we had this cute little store, the back of the store connected to the backyard of our house. And every day I could take my son with me to the store. We made him vice president. and. Um, my mom would come by and take him for walks around the block or take him home to feed him. But people came to the store to see him. And it was really an absolutely wonderful period. Uh, and so for eight years, we stayed home and we had that fun. And then I decided 
I wanted to go back to professional work. He was in school full time. It was time. And that was very difficult. Very, very difficult. For the first time, I understood what people were talking about when they talk about age discrimination in hiring. Because, you know, I'd gotten that much older and I was applying for jobs. I was really very well prepared academically, professionally. I had tons of experience, great references, a PhD in my field, and I couldn't get a job interview. And I applied for job after job, and nobody would even interview me for the job. And in the beginning, I had all sorts of reasons in my mind about why, and people kept saying to me, you know, there's age discrimination, and I just didn't want to believe it. But it was there, and it was true. And um, I share with you the job that I have currently at the Agency on Aging. When I sent in that job application, I sent a cover letter. Um, the person with whom I interviewed is an attorney. And I, as nicely as I could word it, said, I hope the Agency on Aging is not going to discriminate against me just because I'm older. I hope I at least get an interview. And I would like to believe that they would have interviewed me no matter what based on my qualifications, but I wasn't going to just sit back and wait. And, and um, so I had the wonderful opportunity to meet an absolutely phenomenal woman who became my boss, Kate McAvoy, who's the Director of Social Service, uh, Medicaid Services for the State of Connecticut now. And uh, she hired me on the spot. I've been there and now I'm in my 16th year. So uh, it's been a wonderful experience. Could you describe some of the other programs that you're responsible for? You don't want to know all those programs. No. <laughs> I have a huge list of programs. But um, the programs, I think, most relative to this, mm -hmm. uh, there's, uh, we run a respite program for family caregivers. And in that department, um, we have the National Family Caregiver Support Program and the Statewide Respite Program. So the National Family Caregiver Support Program is a program that offers programs, uh, training programs, uh, so, uh, support group programs to family caregivers. It also offers, uh, more importantly, care management services and respite services. So if you're a family caregiver and you just feel like, oh, I'm just swimming, and I'm going under. You can call, talk to a care manager, they'll come out and meet you, they'll do an assessment, they'll give you, you know, a few months of a break by having someone come in maybe once a day to give you a hand so you can get out, just give you a break, but most importantly, give you a person that you can call, someone who can keep in touch with you, someone that if you have a question, if you just feel like you're going to pull your hair out, they're, they're absolutely they are willing to help you. So that program is a terrific program. The other thing that program does, it has some money, um, more or less depending on the time of year and funding, but to help people buy things. The, the most uh, commonly uh, used item that family caregivers have to pay for, for the person they care for, are adult um, diapers. Right. So many people need them nowadays. And they cost about $30 a pack, and it's not at all uncommon to use four packs a month. So that's, nobody covers that. So you're not only doing the caregiving, but out of your pocket, you're having to roll out 120 bucks a month to pay for this. So there's funding available to help with that through this program. So that's a terrific benefit. And then the statewide respite program, it's very similar, but it's particularly for people with dementia. And unlike the National Family Caregiver Support Program, which is, has an age requirement, you, um, the, you have to be at least 60. The um, statewide respite program, you just have to have dementia. It doesn't matter what your age is. So that's a, it's a terrific program. And there's also a caregiver conference that you've been part of, right? Yes. Is it called Fierce Caregiving? Fearless. Fearless. Every November, I think this is our eighth year now, we host a conference which started out as a small conference, and we've changed locations four times because we keep growing. So last year, we were at um, Oakdale, uh, and I can't remember the whole name of Oakdale. It's like Toyota, Oakdale, <laughs> One Nation something or other, but it's Oakdale. Um, 
we uh, host the conference there. Uh, we had over three, well over 300 people last year. Our target for this year is 500. We charge nothing. We do fundraising for it so that everyone can come, spend the day, have breakfast, have lunch, hear speakers, local speakers, national speakers, and it is just in honor and celebration of caregivers and the recognition of what they do and how hard it is. And if along the way we can give some information that's helpful to make it easy or good, if they just have lunch and enjoy talking to other caregivers, that's fine too. But it's really it's a lovely day. We have a lot of sponsors and um, a lot of vendors. Uh, so we usually do a couple of rooms with vendors showing all their different products and talking. And then um, throughout the day, uh, presenters and panelists and um, and the caregivers the opportunity to stand up and talk about what they know and, and what because no one learns more about caregiving from anyone except another caregiver who's been I know that situation I have the answer to that mm -hmm. and and that's what manifests itself at this conference it's a terrific day and it's in November it's on our agency website every year the date and um, now we, we do gain experience and develop wisdom as we age can't help right just one hope advance <laughs> learn how to zig learn how to zag maybe a little better navigate I always ask my guests if you could write a letter to your younger self what are some of the things you might say well this might surprise you and it'll certainly surprise mostly everyone who knows me um, but if I was going to do anything differently um, than what I'd done I would take better care of myself um, I never was a person who liked physical activity. Um, I always thought, oh, God, you know, what do I need to do that for? And so people, skinny people would be out jogging. I thought, oh, God, what do you need that for? Mm -hmm. um, I hope to live a long time. I've already lived a long time, and I'd like to live a lot more years. And, boy, don't you wish that you had hips and knees that would go along with a long life, that you could walk better and do the things that you think, oh, someday I'm going to do this or that. And if you didn't take care of yourself, then you face that challenge of, I still want to do it up in my head, but my body doesn't want to do it. And I'm living through that right now. So if I could change one, just one thing in my life, it would have been to take Oprah Winfrey's advice 20 years ago, get moving. And um, I, I say it to every person I see, particularly if they have a weight problem and they're young, right now, start to get moving. You know, Even more important than the diet, I think, is keeping that body moving. So that, that would be the most important advice I would give anybody. And professionally, I know when we spoke you talked about reflections on working for one place for a long time. Yes. Um, I, I 27 years, I you know, worked for the hospital, and boom, it was gone. So I really try uh, to counsel people, people who work for me. Five years is enough. You know, you want to continually be that openness that you talked about, if you're going to be creative and if you're going to change, it's done much more effectively if you're coming into a new place with fresh eyes. And so I really do encourage people who are building their career to look at that and look about, you know, uh, where can I take the skills I've gotten now and expand on them? How do I explore a different avenue? What does this apply to that I hadn't thought about previously? Uh, I think you become much more well-rounded and a much more satisfying career. And in this day and age where women are career women, whether by choice or need, um, you want a career that satisfies you and makes you feel good. Thank you so much. This has oh, been terrific. And I would invite you to have uh, an opportunity to share your philosophy as we close. Okay. Well, I live by one personal philosophy. Anyone who knows me knows. I believe you have to do the right thing, and you have to do it as well as you can and then let God take care of the rest. Thank you very much for sharing. And please tune in to hear other fascinating women on future segments of Midlife Matters. This is George Ann Lucia, your host. Thanks again.